Um, hey, if you're new with us, if you're watching online for the first time, we've been going through a series called Reflections from the Desert. And it's a series where we've been talking about how in the, the season of Lent, we often choose to take a step back and we give certain things up. And the purpose of that is so that we can grow our relationship with Jesus. Because quite often in our lives, the desert season is thrust upon us. And so for Lent, we choose to enter into a small piece of that, hoping to grow so that when life comes at us, we have some idea of what we're doing. Because quite frankly, and maybe this is just me, but all the things I do to try and control my life when things aren't going well just seem to add to the problems. And there's so many stories in the Bible that we can look at and we can see where, where life came up against people and how their interactions with God, how their reliance on God helped them get through this, excuse me, those seasons. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge to have everything so stripped away from you that you don't even know who you are anymore. And that's what the desert does to us. It exposes to ourselves who we are, to those around us. They see another side of us. And maybe that side is a little bit rougher. And so we want God to meet us in that season, knowing that, that he's the only one that can really intervene in our lives and get us out of the mess that we're in. Sometimes it's because we've caused the mess, and sometimes because it's just the way life happens to us. Today we're going to look at the story of two women from the book of Ruth and how they met God in their desert seasons. And I'm really nervous about this because this is such a powerful book and I don't want us to miss anything from it. Um, I was tempted to read all four chapters to you guys, but what I've decided is that I'm going to give you some little pieces of this and encourage you to go home and read through the story yourself. It's only four chapters. It is worth your time to see what God is doing in the midst of desert seasons for these women. We're going to jump right in. This is from chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So, many from, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, there's some history stuff going on here, which is why the author starts off this way, because he wants us to understand a few things. The first is that this is during the time of the judges. There hasn't been a king in Israel yet. They haven't cried out and begged God to give them a king like the other nations. And so they're ruled by judges. And there's this phrase that comes up in the book of Judges, which chronicles that time period, and the book actually ends with this phrase as well. Everyone did as they saw fit. And the book of Judges is this up and down where the people do whatever they want to rather than what God has commanded them. And then God raises up a judge and they get back on track. And then they fall off again and over and over and over again. And so the author is letting us know that this is one of those seasons where things have fallen off because the text says that there was a famine in the land. Now, in the, the books prior to Judges, when the law is given, God made it very clear. If you do what I have asked you to do, things will go well for you. You will be blessed. You will have life. Your crops will produce in the land. Your herds will multiply. Things will go well for you. But if you turn to other gods, if you do not do as I command, if you don't take care of the widow, the poor, the orphan, things are not going to go well for you. And so we see immediately that there's a famine going on in the land. And then we're introduced to this character, Elimelech, who takes his family from the people of God into Moab. And so my reading of the text suggests that this man is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Because if he was part of the solution, we would see him repenting, crying out to God, asking God to heal the land as the Israelites were commanded. Instead, he goes to Moab. 
Now, if you're not familiar with Moab and the Moabites, these were people who actively came against the people of Israel in their journey out of Egypt into the wilderness where they wandered for 40 years. And during that time period, the Moabites actively came against them and tried to stop the Israelites. As a result, God said to the people of Israel, you don't let them into the places of worship, even to the 10th generation. If a Moabite has lived among you peacefully for 10 generations, they're still not allowed into my presence. And so the Moabites would have been considered fierce enemies of the Israelites. And we see Elimelech taking his family into the land of Moab. And so he's turning to foreign gods. He's turning away from the God of Israel and he's pursuing other gods and he brings his family with him. Now the story unfortunately doesn't get too much better. They've already survived a famine and then Elimelech dies, which means Naomi is now left with her two sons. And what the text continues to go on and tell us is that they married two Moabite women, Orpha and Ruth. Now, if, if Naomi is a follower of the God of Israel, she's put in a very awkward situation because this would have been seen as an awful thing to happen to her. Uh, this is not who you want your, your God-fearing sons to marry, someone who worships other gods, foreigners. This was a challenge all throughout uh, the Old Testament. If you take the time to go and read through it, you see how these situations come up and they happen, and, and oftentimes it's not a great result. And so Naomi uh, is, is now has her second trauma, so to speak, and this one's probably lesser than surviving a famine and, and moving her whole family. But then the story gets a little bit tougher. Both of her sons die. And so now Naomi is left with absolutely nothing. She has two daughters-in-law that she is responsible for. But being a foreigner in Moab, even if her husband had bought land in there, she has no rights to it. She has absolutely nothing. And so she decides that she's going to leave. And she tells her, her daughter-in-laws that she's leaving. And this is where I think we start to see a little bit of, of who Naomi is and who her character is. She is ready to go. And they actually start on the journey. And then she turns to them and she says, why don't you guys go back to your, to your parents? May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud. There is something that has happened with Naomi, and even though she may not have picked these two young women to be her daughters-in-law, there's clearly some love that has happened. And whether it's the bonding through the loss of Naomi's sons or the, the time that she has spent with them, they are not thrilled to be leaving her. And so they say to her, we will go back with you to your people. We see the love that these two young women have for their mother-in-law. But this is going to be a challenge. See, Na Naomi, um, if she can go back and get her family land that was uh, her husband's, uh, she is too old to work the land. She doesn't have the capabilities of, of using this property the way that it could be used. Uh, and so she says to them, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried to them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. When I read this, I can almost feel the pain in Naomi's voice. She is in a situation where she has nothing and she realizes it. She says to, to the two young women, it's better for you to go back with your families, they can find you someone to marry. See, the, the 
old custom was that if a son died, the next son was to, to come in and marry the wife if there hadn't been any children so that the, the name of the older son could be carried on. And what she's saying to them is, not only do I not have any more sons, so I can't give you a husband, but I am too old to have kids. And I'm not going to be able to find a husband because in these days, people didn't marry for companionship. They married to advance family lines. You're seeing Naomi's heart and her heart for these two young women because she knows she cannot provide what will be best for them. One of the daughters, Orpha, finally takes her mother-in-law up on this and she returns home. But the way the, the story continues and the Bible describes it, that like she's saying goodbye to Orpha and looks down and there is Naomi holding on to her. Uh, Ruth is holding on to her, excuse me. And what we're about to read is one of the most famous passages in the book of Ruth. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. See, this is part of the reason why I think that Naomi was probably discipling these two young women the whole time. See, what we have is the confession of faith from Ruth, but this would have been building up in her all the time that she is spending time with Naomi. And for Ruth, what she is doing is she's actually stepping back and saying, my future is not as important as seeing you do well, Naomi. Because Naomi's already spelled it out for you. There is no hope for you if you come with me. In fact, going back to the people of God, to the Israelites, back into Israel, Ruth wouldn't have the, the, the opportunity to marry really at all because she's a foreigner. She's not going to have any opportunity to advance within the culture. She's going to have to essentially beg to receive any resources whatsoever. And yet Ruth is saying, no, being with you is more important than a future husband, than a future family. I am willing to give everything up, every potential possibility to be with you. Now that's a greater expression of love than I think I have ever expressed to anyone in my life. I hope that my wife knows that I'm willing to give up some of my desires for her. And she's done the same for me. But I was thinking about this, and I, I feel a little guilty saying this, but if I was in the situation where I needed to say that to my own mother-in-law, who I love deeply and who I know loves me, would I actually be able to do it? I don't know that I would. Ruth is willing to give everything up for this woman. This is what love looks like. The ability to say, yes, I've had dreams, but I'm willing to give them up for you. And so at this point, Naomi just is like, okay, all right, I, I can't fight with this woman anymore. I give up. Fine, you can come with me. You know what you're getting yourself into. It's on you if things go bad. And so they go back to Jerusalem. And the people of the community notice these two. And the question they ask, is this the one we used to call Naomi? It's been about 10 years, the scripture says, and she's dealt with all this pain and all this loss and depression and grieving can change our physical appearance. And so I think it's interesting that the Bible puts it in a question. It's not a statement, that's Naomi. She's back after all this time. It's, is this the one that we called Naomi? And Naomi hears it. And her response is this, don't call me 
Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi means pleasant, and Mara means bitter. She says, I'm not the person I was when I was here before. I have become bitter. I have become angry with God. Life's hardships have been too much for me, and I can't handle it. Naomi knows the promises of God. She knows that if you are following him as he has prescripted, that God keeps his promises and you will be blessed. And so she sees what's happened in her life. She says, this is the result of my family not following God. This is the way the old covenant was set up. And it's easy to read what's written in the text, I think, and start to ask Naomi in our heads, well, aren't you glad that you're alive? You know, things could be worse. Have you ever been in a bad situation and somebody's like, well, things could be worse. You should be grateful that it's not. Thanks, that helps no one ever. <laughs> if, you, if you were thinking about saying that to someone today, don't. Okay, like I, I, I promise that's not helpful ever. But that's kind of what stirs up in us because we're disconnected from the stories of the people in the Bible. They seem so far away, they're not real to us, but these were real people. This is a woman who has gone through great trauma and her heart is broken. She has nothing left. But what I th I've come to realize is that when we are actually honest with ourselves, it, it actually opens us up to the possibilities that there could be something else. And I wonder how many of us today came in and somebody asked you how you're doing and you said, fine. I know I'm not the only one that does that. I, I struggle sometimes to ask people, how are you doing? Because I'm, I'm worried that maybe they're going to be honest with me. And so often, we encounter people that are in pain. And we want them to get better, not for them, but because their pain, their bitterness, their anger makes us uncomfortable. But what God is inviting us into is being a part of the healing process for each other. God doesn't speak in the book of Ruth. It's interesting. Most of the, the books in the Bible, we have direct words from God, but Ruth isn't one of them. Because what we're going to see as this continues to go on is the story unfolds that God is using his people to communicate his love to each other. And friends, he's, he's asking us to be part of that process as well. And we're actually going to see that in this moment of honesty from Naomi, that the story starts to change. But this idea of God, everything is going wrong, is something that actually flows through the scriptures. And it's something that I think if we learned how to pray this way, we might start to see a little bit more breakthrough in our lives. I, I think back to my teenage years when I wasn't even a believer in Jesus. If you had asked me if I believed in God, I would have told you no. And yet, for some reason, I found myself occasionally praying to him. And I was angry. And I told him I was angry. I told him how unfair he was. I used some language back then that I can't use in church today, at least not when I'm preaching. <laughs> But some of us need to start being honest with God and honest with ourselves about our situation. And now I do suggest that you speak respectfully to him as your creator, as the one who has the power and the capability to change situations. But we've got to start being honest about our pain. Naomi is a beautiful example of that. She's willing to own her bitterness, even to the people who probably used to be her friends. But this cry comes out in the scriptures over and over again. One of my favorite books is Habakkuk. And uh, he, the, 
the book is this conversation between the prophet and God. And quite often the prophet is disappointed with God's answers. But this is one of my favorite lines from the book. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Let me translate this for you. God, I've read in the Bible about how you do all these big things, and I don't see you doing anything today. We're a mess. My life's a mess. Would you do something today? Because I need you to do something. I've got nothing less. There's no other options for me. I've got nothing. If you don't do something, I'm done. That's the heart of what this is saying. Yeah, it's written a little bit cleaner. But I think that this is actually where God wants us. Amen. Where we're willing to be honest with ourselves, we're willing to be honest with each other, and we're willing to be honest with him. So Naomi and Ruth, they get back into Bethlehem and they get settled somewhere. And it just so happens that they arrive around harvest time. And one of the laws that was set up in the Old Testament to protect the vulnerable was that farmers couldn't harvest all of their fields. They had to leave some of it behind for the orphan, the widow, the, the foreigner, the poor, so that people could actually get some, some food. There was no social security net set up back in ancient Israel. And so Ruth says to Naomi, is it okay if I go out and try and collect some grain for us? And Naomi says, yes. And the Bible says that Naomi happened upon the field of a man named Boaz. And I find that wording interesting. It's almost like, my mom told me when I was a kid, there's no such thing as consequ uh, coincidences. And I didn't believe her. But I've seen how in my life that there really aren't any coincidences. That God's hand runs through everything. And so it's almost like this teaser text in there. She just happened to end up here. Now, Boaz is a family member on uh, Naomi's husband's side. And there was this responsibility built into Israelite culture where you took care of your family. And just as Ruth is showing up to harvest, Boaz shows up on his field and he asks the workers, who is this? And now he finds out that this is the daughter-in-law of a relative of his. And at this point, he could have just left things alone, allowed her to harvest the, the pieces that had fallen down. But Boaz shows us a level of kindness that goes beyond what the law requires. Boaz calls her over and says, don't go to any other fields. Because if she was to go to another field, he can't protect her. And he tells the men, don't touch her. See, there were more laws in the Old Testament about protecting livestock than there were about protecting foreigners and foreign women. There was no law to stop any man from doing whatever he wanted with Ruth. And there would have been no punishment had they decided to do something. And so Boaz is taking her under his protection and he tells his men, don't touch her. Don't say anything to her. Don't chastise her. Make sure she's able to gather. In fact, as you're gathering the bundles, throw a little extra on the ground. Now, when I was um, trying to convince my wife that she wanted to marry me, uh, I had a time period where I was unemployed. And uh, I was doing some volunteer work at a cafe, and I was there one day, and somebody brought a sandwich over to me, and they said, I accidentally made the order twice. Do you want this? Otherwise, I'm going to have to throw it out. I said, yeah, sure. I'll do you a favor and eat the sandwich. Well, after this happened two or three times, I started to pick up on what was going on. There were people that were trying to take care of me, make sure that I was doing okay in my desert season, my season of not being employed. 
where I had to rely on the kindness of other people. And so Boaz isn't just allowing her to stay on his field. He's, he's going above and beyond. He even says, the water that the workers brought, help yourself to that. And then he invites her to lunch. And he sends extra home with her. And she gets back and she tells Naomi what's going on and where she's been. And now, between Naomi's honesty, Ruth's love for her and Boaz's kindness, her demeanor starts to change. She starts thinking about possibilities. What could be? Maybe there's a chance for us and this property that was my husband's to be redeemed. Maybe there's actually life for me to have. And so she decides she's going to play matchmaker. And I'm going to skip most of the details, let you go back and read it. But she tells Ruth to, to get cleaned up, put on your best clothes, put some perfume on, and it's harvest season, which means it's party season. It's a season of generosity. And she says, after Boaz has eaten and had a couple drinks, then go talk to him. <laughs> and so that's what happens. And, and Ruth encounters Boaz, and he says, all right, I want to make sure you're taken care of, but by the law... There's another person that before I can buy Naomi's land, we have to go and talk to them. And so Boaz sets the whole situation up, and the guy is ready to buy the land. And then he, Boaz says to him, oh, and by the way, you have to take on the widow Ruth as well. And all of a sudden, knowing that this woman is a foreigner, he kind of backs off. He's like, it might not be good for my estate to take on that estate. And so Boaz jumps on the opportunity. He buys the land from Naomi. Now Naomi is going to be able to survive. Her whole situation has changed. I'm sure she still has pain and carried trauma from what has happened before. That stuff doesn't just go away because your situation has changed. But now she has hope. But Boaz goes even farther. He marries Ruth. He marries this foreign woman. And so now Ruth has been redeemed as well. And they're able to have a child. And the women of the village gather together. And they say, Naomi, you are so blessed. Boaz is awesome. But you are so blessed. And the book, of course, isn't called Boaz. It's called the book of Ruth. And they say of Ruth, she is better than seven sons. Now, seven sons would have been considered the perfect family. And what they are saying is Ruth, because of the way she sacrificed and loved for you, she is better than having seven sons. You can't get better than this. Now, they give birth an Obed is born. Anybody heard of Obed? A couple of you have, probably because you've read the book of Ruth. The story doesn't end here. And in a lot of ways, we are the benefactories of this story. Because Obed has a son, and his name is Jesse. And Jesse has a son, and his name is David, who becomes the second major king in Israel's history, who Jesus' line is directly descended from. See, the sacrifice gave way to the king of kings who would come down to earth and sacrifice for us. That he would give his life up so that we could have life. The same thing that we see Ruth doing for Naomi, Jesus has done for each one of us. The small, seemingly small sacrifice when we read it over the course of 10 minutes has given life to each one of us because God is not limited in our desert. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in your life as you work through the problems, but your bitterness is not too big for God. He can work with that. Your pain isn't too big for God. He can work with that. He's not limited by it. He's not limited by your dysfunction. Does he want to bring you out of it? Absolutely but he's not limited 
by the tragedy of your past. And we have no idea how this will affect future generations as we choose to press into what God is doing in the midst of our desert seasons. It takes so much work. And I think this story illustrates that it takes the community of God coming together to bear each other's burdens, to lift us out of the mess that we are in. And so if you are in a desert season and you don't hear God talking, if you're struggling with hearing from him and getting direction, may I suggest that you lean on us. And for those of us that have gone through pain and hurt in churches before, I know this is incredibly difficult. I know one of the things that you fear the most is that it'll happen again, that you get close to the people of God and they disappoint you again. And you know what? We might disappoint you. But I believe that Newbridge is the type of place where we're able to forgive each other. But I know the hearts of so many of you and your hearts are to lift up the burden, to lift up the broken. And I encourage you, if you know someone struggling, reach out to them. Give up part of your life so that they might live because that's exactly what Jesus has done for you. So worship team, you can come forward. I just want you to press into this. Whatever season you're in, maybe you're in a season of abundance and God is asking you to give. But he's calling all of us to go beyond where we are so that there might be life among us. So that that life can go out of this building into our neighborhood.